stretches to the sky
you, Jesus. switched on. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> Welcome to Charter Oak Lighthouse. Uh, we're here to worship the Lord because um, that's what we were created to do. Amen. <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, without further ado. Let's have 
have some clapping here. Let's, let's, let's get some life in here. Come, let us worship and bow down. It's Psalm 95, 6. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Christian soldiers. Onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. 
Lord Christ the royal master leads against the foe forward into battle see his banners a go onward Christian soldiers marching me of Ephesians 6, chapter 6, 10 through 18, the armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God 
so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Amen. Amen. How's everybody doing today? In the midst of the crazy world we're living in. <laughs> but we have our sure foundation. Amen. We have our feet firmly planted on the rock. Unlike some who have their feet firmly planted in midair, you know? It's like, uh, that's crazy. Thank you, Jesus, for our being our foundation. Um, let's see.
morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. For those of you who are uh, joining via live stream, we welcome you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I hope you guys had a good Thanksgiving with your family. It's a beautiful day out, isn't it? It's good to be in the house of the Lord. And the Bible says this is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice, right? And be glad in it. Amen. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Amen. It's good to see you guys this morning. Do have just a few announcements. And uh, this Tuesday morning, uh, there's going to be a group of people praying in the fellowship hall. You guys are more than welcome to join us. Tuesday night, the men's study starts up and we're going to be in the book of First Corinthians. So read ahead, men, for those of you who are going to be joining us. Uh, the ladies study is on this Thursday. OK, so it is uh, 630. Not sure of the location. You can talk to uh, Alice after the service. But it is uh, this Thursday at 6.30. Also, um, I do want to remind you, we do have a shepherd's pantry. And um, for those of you who have, uh, maybe you know someone who's in need of uh, any type of food, we have a shepherd's pantry. For those of you who would like to contribute to the shepherd's pantry, we, uh, we can use a few items. If you can think along the lines of something uh, quick and easy. Uh, sometimes we get some um, homeless people that come through during the week and uh, would like something to eat just right there on the spot. Obviously, they don't have nothing to cook with, so if you can think along those lines, something ready to eat, open and non-perishable, um, and so don't forget that. And if you have any um, questions about the Shepherd's Pantry, you can either see me after the service or talk to Larry, or I'm sorry, uh, Caesar Vargas. Uh, Caesar Vargas is heading up the uh, Shepherd's Pantry. So um, I believe that's it as far as announcements. Um, if we can have the uh, ushers come forward. So prayer meeting, men's study, women's study. Don't forget, keep, keep our church in prayer. As you guys know, we live in some, we're living in some very challenging times for uh, not only our church, but the church in America. So continue to pray for the church and uh, that the Lord would just bring a revival to our country. Uh, pray that God's truth justice and righteousness will prevail um, and that's what we need today uh, we need a we need truth and um, so pray for pray for revival in our country and in our community uh, we need um, we need revival amen and uh, you know it's challenging uh, in these days to spread the gospel everyone thinks uh, you have the covid virus or something and uh, they don't want to get near you they don't want to receive anything from you so even even passing out a gospel track can be challenging for some people. You know, they don't even want to uh, touch it. But um, we just got to think of different ways to share the gospel with people and evangelize. And, you know, uh, our, like I said last week, our mission hasn't changed, uh, right? And so a lot of things have changed, but our mission as a church, as God's people, has not changed. And so we just need to figure out different ways about reaching people. So pray for our church. Uh, pray for our country. And pray for the church in America and at large. Amen. So let's pray for this morning's offering and, and uh, ask for God's blessing. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your faithfulness to us, Lord. You are good and you never change. Uh, Father, you have provided everything that we need uh, as a church, uh, as a people, Lord. Uh, you take care of us, even in times of famine, Lord. Uh, you provide for us and we just thank you we ask for your blessing on this offering lord uh, we want to honor you with our with our offering lord with our finances and so we pray that you would bless this offering and lord we do want to pray for um, our special touch on our brother rob this morning uh, Kay, uh, father so many people in our congregation who are are sick i pray for my parents lord my mom and dad um, lord as they're watching lord you know their needs and there's so many others in our congregation that need your touch. And Father, we just call on your name. We ask that you would meet the needs of your people. And we thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving us everything that we need for life and for godliness. And we do want to pray um, for Paul's granddaughter, Ariana. She goes into surgery here in a couple days. Uh, we pray that you would lead and guide the surgeons, Lord. That you would bring healing to that little girl, Lord. And that you would continue to use her to be a light, Lord, to everyone she comes in contact with. And so, Father, we thank you for that. Watch over her. 
Uh, may she sense your presence in a very special way this week, Lord. And we pray for a quick and speedy recovery. And we ask all these things, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, amen. God bless. not to try and kill myself anymore. Save me and I swear I'll be a better father. I'll be a better man. 
I'll be a better everything. All I ask is, make me a better swimmer. Oh God, I can't do this to Julie. We can't do this to Julie. to obey every one of the Ten Commandments. I shall not kill. I shall not commit adultery. I shall not. I, uh, I'll learn the Ten Commandments and then I'll obey every one of them. Just get me back to the beach. I'll be honest in business. I promise not to sell lakeside lots. Unless there's a lake around. I want to see another sunrise. I want to see another sunset. It was a mistake, God. I never really wanted to kill myself. I just wanted to get your attention. Help me make it. I'll give you 50% of everything I make. 50%, God. I want to point out that nobody gives 50%. I'm talking gross, God. right away I know I said 50% Lord but 10% to start if you don't want your 10% then don't take it I know it was you that saved me but it was also you that made me sick Good morning and welcome to Charter Oak Lighthouse. My name is Pastor Larry. There's a funny scene found in James Mitchner's novel, Hawaii. One of the main characters in that novel is Abner Hale. He's a Christian missionary there in Hawaii and he's trying to instill some values into the natives of the land, the, the higher echelon leaders. One rule he emphatically insists on is no adultery. But which adultery, the nobles ask? In Hawaii, we have 23 kinds of adultery. You have what? Abner gasps. And this would be our problem, they explain. If we said simply there will be no adultery without indicating which kind, everyone who heard would reason, well, they don't mean our kind of adultery, they mean the other 22 kinds. But on the other hand, if we list all 23 kinds, one after the other, Somebody will surely say, we've never heard of that kind before. Let's try it. And things would be worse than before. Abner Hale thought hard about how to solve this dilemma and came up with some special wording for the rule, which the Hawaiians understood perfectly. He said to them simply, thou shalt not sleep mischievously. Thou shalt not sleep mischievously. What an accurate rendition of the seventh commandment. And what applies to the 23 forms of adultery that the Hawaiians have applies to sexuality in our own times. Thou shalt not sleep mischievously. This is God's plan for your life. That you be holy. That you be pure. That you be undefiled. But here is the problem we're all facing. Every day, we all go out on a battlefield. We all engage in a war. No, it's not a war that's fought with bombs and guns for some piece of land, but it's a war nonetheless. It's the battle for your mind, the battle for your thoughts, 
the battle for control of your attention. And in no area is this battle waged more fiercely than in the area of our sexuality. We're living in a world that is over-sexualized. Why? Because the enemy knows that if he can get you distracted into this area, if he gets you drawn into sexual immorality, that he can destroy you spiritually. He can make you ineffective spiritually. So the enemy then has filled our world with all sorts of temptations, with all sorts of sexual traps. Satan knows that this is the winning strategy when it comes to human beings. Turn on the TV, turn on the radio, look on the internet, the cable networks, pay-per-view, and you'll find our society is being driven by sexual immorality. All around us, there's depictions of sexually immoral acts, promotion of sexually immoral acts, homosexuality, bisexuality, fornication, all manner of perversion. It's being promoted before us. And the goal is to get you to buy into it, to accept it, to participate in it. Why? Because the enemy knows that he can conquer you through this. He can separate you from a holy God, and then he can destroy your life. A pastor named Brian Larson related this story. Temptation is always seductive, and so we can hardly have too many reminders of Satan's purpose in it. Last week, I had a simple reminder. I was at a party over lunch with a dozen of my fellow workers. It was a warm Chicago day in early September, and we had the windows wide open. Soon a bee found its way in, and after buzzing near me, it landed on some food on the table. One of my colleagues, a few chairs away, took hold of an empty bottle of sparkling grape juice and put the mouth of the bottle near the bee. When she did that, I expected the bee to be startled and to fly away for its own safety, as a butterfly might do. Instead, without a moment's hesitation, the bee flew to the mouth of the bottle as, it is done, as if it had done this a hundred times before and climbed inside the narrow opening. Immediately, my colleague put the cap on the bottle and screwed it shut. The bee spent the rest of our party drinking at the bottom of the bottle. As far as I know, the bee was never released. What was my colleague's purpose in luring the bee into the bottle? Was she concerned about the bee? Wanted it to enjoy her hospitality and have plenty to drink? No, she dislikes bees. Her purpose was to capture and control. The bee had flown into her trap. When Satan incites us to indulge in the pleasures of this world in a manner that oversteps God's commands, what is his purpose? Is he concerned that we might miss out on the good things of God? No, he despises human beings. He despises us. His purpose is capture and control. We must never forget that when we follow him, we walk into his trap. When the tempter comes around, it's better to have the instincts of a butterfly than a bee. Why is it that America is being so morally out of control? Why is it that so many lives are crippled and destroyed around us? It's because we've abandoned the Ten Commandments. And in particular, we've abandoned the Seventh Commandment. Our failure to live by these commands has had grave consequences for our nation. Would you open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 14, and let's take a look at this most vital of commandments. What is the seventh commandment, and what does it mean? In the Hebrew, it simply states, lo tina ap. In English, this command is simply translated, you shall not commit adultery. Now, op speaks of marital unfaithfulness, typically of a married person lying with someone they're not married to. The word used 
in the Bible for sexual unfaithfulness is na'ap. The Lord uses this word to describe Israel when they chase after false gods. They are committing spiritual adultery. Now, in the past, I would encounter this command, and I would wonder, well, why did God elevate this particular prohibition on sexual sin and place it within the Ten Commandments? Why not one of the other prohibitions? Why not one of the other sexual sins? The answer that I've come up with as to the why question here is quite simple and yet profound. God focuses on the issue of adultery in the Ten Commandments because I believe it is an issue that embraces the entirety of our sexuality. In saying you shall not commit adultery, God is really saying that our sexuality is to be exercised within the bonds of marriage. He's saying that human sexuality was intended to find its expression within marriage. Human sexuality is intended to find its expression within that very special relationship. So then in that vein, God chooses to focus here on the marital relationship because this is the proper conduit for our sexual behavior. Thus the prohibition, you shall not commit adultery, is a call to faithfulness to our marital partner. And when you think about it then, any sexuality that is expressed outside of the marital relationship is some form of adultery. Now, how does, far does this command go? Well, I see it embracing the entirety of our sexuality. This command covers it all. Now, there might be those people out there who say to me, well, pastor, fornication is not adultery. How is fornication covered under this command? How is the idea of two people having sex outside of marriage covered by this command? Well, if you give yourself to another person, then you are being unfaithful to your future husband or bride. If you give yourself to another person outside of the bonds of marriage, then you are being unfaithful to that relationship that God has in mind for you, that God has planned for you. So therefore, any sexual expression that's not contained within the marital relationship is really a form of adultery and it's wrong. So fornication, sex outside of marriage is wrong. It violates that marital relationship that God wants you to have. Homosexuality is wrong. Prostitution is wrong. Bestiality is wrong. Pornography is wrong. However, it violates God's plan for your sexuality then, it is wrong. Whatever violates the sanctity of the marriage relationship is wrong. Jesus goes so far as to raise this sin to the level of a mental construct and not just a physical acting out. Jesus declared in Matthew 5, 27 and following, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In other words, if you entertain sexual thoughts for anyone who is not your mate, then Jesus says that is sin. As one theologian put it, sexual intercourse outside of marriage is always wrong. Why? Because those who indulge in it are trying to isolate one aspect of union, the physical, from all the other aspects that were intended to make a total union of two people. There is nothing wrong with sexual pleasure any more than there is with the pleasure of eating. 
However, just as attempting to enjoy the pleasures of eating and tasting without swallowing and digesting is aberrant and wrong, so attempting to enjoy sex as an isolated physical sensation is wrong. Another pastor put it this way, sex is like fire. In a fireplace, it's warm and delightful. Outside the hearth, it's destructive and uncontrollable. That fireplace that God made for the sexual relationship is marriage. When you take the sexual relationship outside of the bonds of marriage, then you put fire in your living room. You put fire in the middle of your house. And we're seeing the destruction that has been visited upon untold millions of people who are not living by God's commands. I see the destroyed relationships because of sexual sin. People unable to have proper relationships because of the sin in their lives. I see the destroyed families torn apart because of sexual sin. I see people suffering and dying from sexually transmitted diseases because of sexual sin. I see the impact upon children's lives. Children giving birth to children. People having abortions. It's all horrible, it's all terrible, and it's what the enemy wants for you. The enemy wants to destroy your life, and as I said earlier, perhaps his prime avenue is through your sexuality. Now, how is this commandment violated, and what are the consequences of violating? In the bigger picture of life, this commandment is violated when we engage in any sexual relationship that is outside of the bonds of marriage. To begin with, this commandment is violated through the sin of adultery. The act of being unfaithful to your mate. A quick poll in Divorce Magazine revealed that 28% of women and 36%, 36% of men admit to having an adulterous affair at least once in their married lives. Estimates of infidelity have been as high as 60% in men and 40% in women. In the same poll, it was revealed that 68% of men said they would leave their partner if they discovered they were having an affair. 79% of the women said the same thing. As we just saw, Jesus' definition of adultery includes unfaithful thoughts and mental fantasies. Jesus is basically telling us that sexual sin, that adultery begins in the mind. So it's the actions that follow our thoughts. And when we give in to those lustful desirings, when we allow those lustful desirings to roll through our thought process, then it can give birth to sexual sin and to adultery. So the real battle over adultery, the real battle over sexual sin, begins in the mind. You must clean up your mind in order to conquer this sin. Well, how do we do that, Pastor? We do that by submitting ourselves to our Lord and Savior, allowing the Holy Spirit to make us holy, focusing our attention on God's Word, filling our minds with pure thoughts and holiness and obedience to the Lord. So our thought life matters. It makes a tremendous difference. And adultery breaks then the bond of trust between a married couple. And adultery destroys the marriage relationship. It destroys 
families. It destroys nations, really. The marriage relationship is the bedrock upon which a civil society is based. Now, a second way in which the seventh commandment is violated is through the sin of fornication, which is defined as having sex outside of the bonds of marriage. The Apostle Paul sternly warns that people who live in a lifestyle of unrepentant fornication will not enter into the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, Paul says this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. These are strong words and not to be taken lightly. Think about it. If you're involved in a sexual relationship outside of the bonds of marriage, then Paul says that you will not make it into the kingdom of God. If this is a sin that defines your life, if you live your life in the pursuit of sexual sin, perhaps you're not in a long-going relationship, but you're looking for a series of one-night stands, a series of short relationships. You're looking for this sort of uh, gratification factor. If you're living that way, then Paul says you're not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. And I think the point that Paul is making here is that having a saving relationship with Jesus Christ changes people. It's impossible for you to have a saving relationship and not be changed by it, not be transformed by it. When Jesus gets a hold of your life, he changes you. And so if you're involved in these gross sins, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, uh, he lists a, a, a number of things there, thievery. Uh, if you're involved in extortion, which would really tie into sort of gang activity, all of these different things as a lifestyle, as a way of living, then you will not make it into the kingdom. Why? Because I think he's really saying you're not really saved. When you're saved in Jesus Christ then, you will want to obey him and these sorts of sins are going to fall away. Now what are the consequences of this sin? First and foremost, we have the problem of children being born to unwed mothers. I would characterize it as the problem of fatherlessness. Study after study confirms the importance of having both parents in the life of a child, the child being raised by both a mother and a father. This sort of sexual sin often leads then to children being raised alone by their only mother and not their father. So it breaks up the home. It destroys the home. What is the most in fact, important factor that leads to children being, um, growing up in poverty? The most important factor that leads to children growing up to be abusers. The most important factor that leads to children becoming members of gangs. The most important contributing factor to these problems has been found in study after study. The lack of a father in the home. The destruction of marriage. Children being raised without their dads. 
When you remove a parent from a child's life, it greatly increases that they will be at risk for dangerous behavior. Carl Zinsmeister, a leading researcher on the family and a DeWitt Wallace Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute said this, there is a mountain of scientific evidence showing that when families disintegrate, children often end up with intellectual, physical, and emotional scars that persist for life. We talk about the drug crisis, the education crisis, and the problem of teen pregnancy and juvenile crime. But all these ills trace back predominantly to one source, broken families. A second consequence of this sin, and all sexual sins for that matter, is the consequence of sexually transmitted diseases. According to recent statistics from the Centers for Disease Control, there are 20 million new cases of sexually transmitted diseases every year in the U.S. Two million people in this country have chlamydia. 20 million people are infected with HPV. 45 million people have genital herpes, which is an incurable disease. Let's talk about AIDS. Since the beginning of the epidemic, an estimated 700,000 people with AIDS in the United States have died. Approximately 1.1 million people are living with AIDS in America. Approximately 16,000 people per year die of AIDS in America. It's estimated that 40 million people are currently infected with the AIDS virus worldwide. And we know that since 1981, that 32 million people have died of AIDS in the world. In some countries in Africa, 25% or more of the population is infected with AIDS. It's shocking to realize that virtually all this death and destruction could be done away with if people would follow God's plan for human sexuality. If they would contain their sexuality within the marital relationship and remain faithful to that relationship. Think about it. There could be no spread of sexual disease then. Sexual diseases would die out within a generation if everybody followed God's plan for human sexuality. A third consequence of fornication, of adultery, of sexual sin is abortion, the murder of innocent babies. Every day in this country, 1,000 unwed teenage girls become mothers. Every year, approximately 1 million babies are slaughtered on the altar of abortion. Over 99% of these abortions are performed merely for what is euphemistically called the mother's convenience. A fourth consequence of this sexual sin is that it doesn't deliver the satisfaction that people think they will get out of it. And that is true for all the other sexual sins. A recent survey of sexuality, which was called the most authoritative ever by US News and World Report, provided some very eye-opening answers. Researchers at SUNY Stony Brook and the University of Chicago found that of all sexually active people, the people who report being the most physically pleased and emotionally satisfied were married couples. These researchers found that not only is sex better in marriage, but it is best if you have only one sexual partner in a lifetime. Physical and emotional satisfaction started to decline when people had more than one sexual partners, the researchers stated. UCLA researchers reported cohabitators experienced significantly more difficulty in subsequent marriages with issues of adultery, alcohol, drugs, and independence than couples who had not cohabitated. In fact, marriages preceded by cohabitation are 50 to 100% more likely to break up than those marriages that are not preceded by cohabitation. Another way in which this sin is violated is through the sin of homosexuality. To better understand this point, we must begin by understanding that the Bible condemns homosexuality as a serious sin. As we discussed in our uh, examination of the fifth commandment, God 
has some very strong words about homosexuality and places a very strong prohibition against it. Let's briefly review what the Bible has to say. In Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, the Lord says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. In Leviticus chapter 20, he lays down this penalty. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says this, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So Paul in the New Testament confirms that homosexuality continues to be a grave sin, that it's not done away with, that the condemnation of it proceeds. In Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, Paul presents homosexuality as the ultimate perversion of God's plan and design for human sexuality. In those verses, Paul tells us that homosexuality is a crime against nature. It's a crime, in other words, against God's physical plan for us all. In verse 26 of Romans 1, Paul says this, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves that penalty of their error which was due. So homosexuality is condemned in the Bible in strongest terms. Why? Well, first, it is a perversion of God's plan for human sexuality. God intended that the sexual relationship be reserved for the bonds of marriage between a man and a woman. So homosexuality then does not fulfill God's plan. It is a perversion of it. Now, it's also a grave sin because the Bible tells us that it is a violation of God's plan for us on a physical level. He intended us to have a sexual relationship with a member of the opposite sex within marriage. And that is his plan for our sexuality. We are to enjoy our sexuality within the bonds of that relationship. So from God's perspective, a man marrying a man does not qualify as a marriage. A, man, a woman marrying a woman does not qualify as a marriage. In Matthew chapter 19, the Pharisees asked Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Jesus responded, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So Jesus emphasizes the biblical truth that marriage can only be between a man and a woman. That is God's intent, that is God's plan. God is the one who designed us for marriage. God is the one who instituted marriage in the human world. We go all the way back to the book of Genesis 
And God brings the woman to the man and joins them together. And that is the definition of marriage from the very beginning. So any other sort of union is not a true marriage. Any other sort of union is not what God designed. Now, there are very serious consequences for homosexual behavior. Paul says that they receive in themselves, pardon me, this is in verse 27 of Romans 1, that they receive in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. According to the D.C. Family Research Council, which itself cited dozens of others, other experts and studies, they said this, the average age of a man dying of AIDS is 40. The average age of a male homosexual dying of all causes is in the mid-40s. Obituaries in the gay press suggest that the gay lifestyle cuts 20 years off one's life expectancy. This is from a Washington News article. A new study which analyzed tens of thousands of gay obituaries and compared them with AIDS death from the Centers of Disease Control has shown that the life expectancy for homosexuals is about 20 years shorter than the general public. The study entitled Gay Obituaries Closely Track the Officially Reported Deaths from AIDS has been published in Psychological Reports. So homosexuality then brings on serious consequences. And there are some other statistics that are very shocking. Homosexual men are three times as likely to have alcohol and drug abuse problems. They are 14 times more likely to have had syphilis, 23 more times likely to have contracted a venereal disease, and they are thousands of times more likely to have contracted AIDS. Homosexual men are 50 times more likely to be murdered than the general population. They are 60 times more likely to commit suicide. They are 45 times more likely to die in an auto accident. Wow. Now I want to ask you a question. Forget what God says. Forget what the Bible says. But if we love our friends and our family, would we want to encourage them into a homosexual lifestyle? knowing that there are all of these very serious consequences to it. Now, how then do we keep this commandment, and what are the blessings of keeping it? The seventh commandment says, you shall not commit adultery. So we first keep this commandment by submitting our sexuality to the will of God by submitting our sexuality to his word. He tells us that we are to confine our sexuality within the marital relationship. There is to be no adultery. There is to be no unfaithfulness to our mate. We are to reserve ourselves for our mate. So we are first to submit to God's will. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, the Lord said to the first man and the first woman, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So he designed this very special relationship in our lives with purposes in mind. The first being the propagation of the human race. And so as we then obey this command, then we actually keep the human race alive. And then he desired that men and women would share a very special intimacy with each other that they share with no one else. And that that special intimacy would bring them together, would bind them together in a very special way as it is written in Genesis 2, 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So to achieve our goal, God's goal for our sexual relationship, we must submit to him. We must allow him to direct 
our paths. Let's talk about the blessings of keeping this command. When we keep this command first, our sexual relationships will be clean. It will be holy. There will be no guilt or shame involved. As the husband and wife come together in God's purpose for their lives, then everything is right. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, we're told marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. So when we keep this command, then we keep our sexual relationship holy, and God blesses that relationship in our lives. Secondly, obeying this command builds up a marriage rather than tears it down. Sexual intimacy brings men and women together in a very special way. And in that unique marital relationship, then this very special bond develops as a result of not just the psychological and the emotional, but also the physical. And God intended it to be that way, that the bond of marriage might be the best bond of all. And then thirdly, obeying this commandment is a crucial factor in raising up godly children. In Malachi chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, the Lord says this, And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. For you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did not he make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. So then, this commandment is a crucial factor in raising godly children. The Bible tells us that a large purpose, a large reason for God creating the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife is that they might raise up godly offspring that the bond that they have together, the love for one another, the love that they have for God, might be passed on to their children. That they might be godly examples to their children. That they would raise their children up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. So a solid relationship between a husband and a wife is a building block upon which Godly children are raised. The seventh commandment states clearly and emphatically, you shall not commit adultery. And in saying you shall not commit adultery, God is really saying that your sexuality is to be contained within the marriage relationship. That his plan for you is that you would have a relationship with someone of the opposite sex, and that you would be bound together in marriage, and that you would experience all of the blessings then that come with that wonderful bond that God has designed you for, and that wonderful bond that God has initiated. Now, many have looked on this command and said, well, God is just out to spoil our fun. All of the commands that he makes in the area of sexuality just show that he's sort of a cosmic killjoy. He's squeamish and stuffy. He's prudish. 
But what we've studied this morning reveals God's reason for restricting sex to marriage. As a loving father, you see, he wants what is best for his children. He wants his children to have the very best. And he knows that what is best for you is the marriage relationship. He doesn't want you to spend your life going through dead-end relationships, meaningless relationships, emotional and psychological trauma. This all comes with sexual relationships that are outside of marriage. No, the Lord God loves us and he wants us to have the very best and the most fulfilling relationships possible. And that is what marriage is all about. Now, in light of this, I'd like to conclude by challenging us with something the Apostle Paul wrote. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Today, we are engaged in a war, as I said at the very beginning of this message. It's a war for your thoughts. A war for control of your mind. A war for control of your sexuality. The enemy is running to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. He has filled the world with all of his temptations. He has filled the world with all of his snares and all of his traps. He wants to destroy you. My hope is that you will submit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, that you will make him your Lord and your Savior, and that you will allow him to cleanse you, to lead you, and to guide you into a wonderful and fulfilling life. Let's bow our heads and our hearts. Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for this command, what it means to us and how important it is to us. Father, we need to submit our sexual relationships to you. We need to submit our sexual relationships to your plan of marriage. Help us, Father God, to see how important this is, Father, and what a blessing it will be in our lives. I pray for those who might be involved in sexual sin right now. I'd like to just take a moment, take a moment for you to examine your heart while we have our heads bowed in prayer. Is there anything that you need to confess to the Lord Is there an unholy sexual relationship in your life that must go? Consider your ways before him right now. Father, we know that we have your forgiveness in Jesus Christ. We have your mercy and your grace. We lay down all of our sexual sins, we lay down all of the sins in our lives before you. 
And we ask, Father, that you would cleanse us from them and help us to walk in holiness and in righteousness. While you have your head bowed, I want to offer the Lord Jesus Christ to you because he is the means by which we will be washed and made clean. He is the one who can change and transform our hearts and our thoughts. If you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, you can do that by submitting your life to him right now. Surrender your heart to him. And you can confess that through this simple prayer, if you will repeat after me. Father God in heaven, I repent of the times that I violated your word. I repent of the times that I've wounded your heart. Father, I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I make him my king. Wash me clean in the blood of Jesus, Lord. Wash my sins away. Help me to walk in holiness and righteousness from this day forward. And I pray all of these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. The Lord bless you and have a wonderful day in Jesus Christ. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified in my life, Lord, be glorified today. Let's sing that again. In my life.
for me And I will open up my heart And let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in 